number 50. Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy Kong's Quest Before AAA games shifted towards relying on more narrative-centric, high-fidelity cinematic experiences in order to be any sort of good, video games relied mainly on mechanics and new ways to exploit known genres through those mechanics. The Donkey Kong Country series is one of the last examples of super productions of that era and a masterpiece in its own right. With Donkey Kong Country 2, being its crown jewel. Donkey Kong Country 2 has the best controls and flow of any platform that I've played, rivaled only in that regard by Super Mario World, which is about the highest praise I can give to any game. The Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion Oblivion was very early released for the Xbox 360, and it was one of the first major games that took the fantasy world uh, and put it into sort of an open world uh, environment, aside from other games from earlier in the series, such as Morrowind. It is so easy to get lost for hours on end, going through dungeons, looking for shrines, joining one of the many guilds, and rising to become the leader of that guild. Uh, you can even go and not even worry about the main quest. The way the music and sound effects and the visuals just blend to make this perfect immersive environment, it was one of my favorite Xbox 360 games and one that will remain in that spot for a very long time. Batman Arkham Asylum was the Batman video game that everyone always wanted. A satisfying combat system, access to all the gadgets, and interactions with the rogues gallery of Batman villains. Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill are arguably the best actors to ever take on the roles of Batman and Joker respectively, so to have them do the characters for this series was a huge selling point. The Scarecrow challenges where Batman gets dropped into a Lewis Carroll nightmare because he was drugged are astounding. It allowed Rocksteady to get creative with the level design so you can really push Batman's combat capabilities. I love this game and I can't wait to get back to it and play through it again sometime soon. Final Fantasy IX If Final Fantasy VII took the series away from its roots with its deviation from the fantasy norms at the beginning of the PlayStation 1 generation, then Final Fantasy IX brought it all back together at the end of it. Final Fantasy IX took the series back to its somewhat super deformed character aesthetics, a bright colorful world, a huge fantasy backdrop, and themes that would sit beside its Super Nintendo era predecessors. This game included a cast of very lovable characters, especially fan favorite Vivi, and dealt with heavy themes. This world was a massive and held plenty of seekers to explore, as well as references to other games in the series. I am still convinced that Zidane is referring to Cloud when he is looking at the large sword in his shop and thinks, I knew a spiky haired guy that used a sword something like this. Like practically every other Final Fantasy, the combat system was as deep as it was fun to play, and that battle theme will have you humming it for hours. DuckTales. DuckTales is probably the first licensed game I ever played, and it kind of set a bar that was just a little too high for a lot of licensed games to follow to meet. It's a fantastic game. It's great. The graphics are really good for the NES, and the gameplay is stellar. And not a lot of licensed games were able to live up to that after DuckTales made its mark on NES history. Number 45. 
Earthbound was released on June 5th in 1995. This title is a direct sequel to the until recently Japan-only NES title, Mother. The game is one of the few RPGs that take place in a modern setting. The game's plot starts out with a time-traveling bee that explains to you it's up to you to save the world from an evil alien entity named Gygus. In order to defeat Gygus, the game's protagonist, Ness, must visit eight sanctuaries and absorb their power in order to become Bound to the Earth, or Earthbound. Earthbound's notable for its memorable characters, quirky writing, and wit, which are a result of the game's writer and producer, Shigesato Itoi. The game's gameplay is basic, appearing, however, there's a lot of nuance to it. The game's turn-based battle system is ripped directly from the Dragon Quest series, with you looking directly at your opponents from a sort of first-person view. From the game's rolling HP totals in battle, to its backpack item management system, there's nothing that totally compares to Earthbound. Graphic of Earthbound is divisive. While many say that the game's graphics look overly simple, I'd say they look extremely clean and well-defined. The game's soundtrack is memorable with a good spread of lively, upbeat tracks to the darker, melodic, and often disturbing tracks. Overall, the game's entire package is gripping. The characters, environments, dialogue, music, and plot combine to create one of the greatest RPGs of all time. Do a barrel roll! Star Fox 64. Star Fox 64 took the classic title from the Super Nintendo and gave it a stellar makeover. Being the first game bundled with the Rumble Pack and adding the split screen 4 player mode, Star Fox 64 became an instant hit. With enhanced 3D graphics and the addition of voice acting to the colorful cast of characters, Fox, Falco, Slippy and Peppy had couch co-opers barrel rolling to the wee hours of the morning on a school night. Your main vehicle is the R-Wing, which is primarily on a fixed path, but can also veer off on secret paths. There are a few levels where you can drive the Landmaster, a tank-like vehicle that can hover for a few seconds and roll to avoid enemy fire. But it's not nearly as satisfying as flying the R-Wing, where you can do a somersault and blast your enemy to pieces from behind. Star Fox 64 was well designed, innovative, and flat out a blast to play, which proved to be the necessary ingredients for another lucrative Nintendo franchise. Hey lady, you know what I'm gonna do? Something like this. Grand Theft Auto Vice City was released in October of 2002. While technically the fifth game in the GTA series, it could be considered the second game in the GTA 3 trilogy. Rather than using modern day setting like GTA 3, the game turns the series on its head by having the entire entry take place in the 1980s. The game's plot chronicles its protagonist rising from recently released prisoner to drug kingpin of Miami. The movie Scarface heavily influences the game's plot with several missions that are directly referential to the film. Vice City's gameplay, much like other Grand Theft Auto games, is an open-world sandbox game where you can pretty much do anything you'd like. The game's story progresses through missions that are generally improved over Grand Theft Auto 3. A major downside of Vice City is how poorly the game is aged. The game's graphics and physics just don't hold up compared to modern Grand Theft Auto entries. The strongest part of this title is its licensed soundtrack, which is probably the best licensed soundtrack ever released. The game features an amazing spread of 80s new wave, pop, heavy metal, Cuban, and hip-hop music that I find myself constantly returning to just to listen to the music. Although Vice City has aged poorly, it's one of the more interesting titles in the Grand Theft Auto series as it takes a totally different approach to the game's setting. But where the game really shines is its soundtrack, and it should be checked out for that aspect alone. Portal 2 Portal 2 is a fun, unique first-person puzzle game. The game takes place in the future at the Aperture Science and Enrichment Center years after the first game, where an evil robot imprisons people and makes them go through dangerous tests using a newly developed tool, the Portal Gun. This time, the lab is run down and covered in foliage when GLaDOS, the evil robot, imprisons you again for defeating her the last time you met her. Use your portal gun to make portals, traverse the test, and escape the evil facility. Overall, this game has good graphics, unique, fun gameplay, and a great story. Number 41. I need something smuggled out of the city. Jesus Christ. It's just cargo, Joel. The Last of Us. It's hard to imagine that with the way zombies have infected pop culture that you could create a video game with a post-apocalyptic zombie theme feels so fresh and interesting. But Naughty Dog did it. How do you know them? I just want some simple gear enough to set me on my way. I reckon he's got something to do with that girl. He's got everything to do with that little girl. 
They created a world you wanted to explore with characters that you really cared about. You wanted to see them make it, you wanted to see them survive together. They twisted the zombie formula by making the undead be a sort of fungal monster, which gives it a touch more feeling of realism than a lot of zombie outbreaks in other media. The story and world building is the game's strongest point, but don't think that's all it does well. Stealth, exploration, and combat are all included to create a very powerful gaming experience. You can play this masterpiece on its original PS3 or the remastered version for the PS4, but either way, you should play it.